and I teased this back on Tuesday. I said, we are going to go to Petros Papadakis, and we're going to get to the bottom of the Jeff Goldblum story well, that we've been no talking bottom. about for a couple of, uh, we'll get to that in a sec. But I'm going to start with, I mean, first of all, where were you for the uh, earthquake? Did you get woken up by the earthquake on Thursday morning? No, I was up, and I saw the tweets. So I was up already, and I was milling around when the rest of the family was asleep, and I saw the tweets. uh, The Valley, I know you understand some part of Los Angeles geography, but the Valley is in a different spot than me, and this was pretty deep in the Valley. Now, there's been some really big earthquakes in the Valley, like the North Ridge quake when I was younger, that we definitely felt and woke us all up and all that. But uh, this was not the case for us this time. But I'm from here, so earthquakes are not the end-all, be-all. I mean, they I feel them, and every once in a while I'll take a videotape of the pool or something. But it's not as fascinating for people, I think, here. If If I have the right kind of tone there does that make sense i mean whenever there's an earthquake you get like a huge earthquake boner oh yeah no doubt then there are a lot of people out there that are like i remember there was an earthquake once and you were in the hotel uh, yeah i've been out here i've been out for yeah i've been out for three different earthquakes in california right and it was almost like you were on the grassy knoll when kennedy got that's right that's what i felt like yeah, you were really excited, which was great. You know, I remember – do you remember a quarterback named John David Booty? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, John David, who was uh, from Shreveport. Louisiana, and came yeah. Out, yeah, and came way out to uh, USC and, and ended up winning two Rose Bowls. I mean, that guy's got to be in the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame. He, he ended up having a great career at USC and left high school early in the whole deal. And the only thing John David Booty cared about was what to do if there was an earthquake. Yeah, right. He asked everybody, like everybody. He took like a poll, like, so you're saying get in the doorway. <laughs> and it was just, it's always been, fat, you know, as somebody who's from the West Coast, and, you know, there's been earthquakes, and when you're a kid and your parents are, like, picking up your sister by her crotch and her neck and throwing her under the table, and they're screaming at each other, like, John, there's a chandelier, you know all that and i mean uh it's frightening but i guess you just end up getting kind of used to them in a certain way unless people start dying and freeways start collapsing which sucks yeah look, obviously it's it's interesting because there were a bunch of california guys who ended up uh, on the east coast and if you were anywhere where tornadoes might be the california crew was all obsessed with tornadoes right the oh yeah the tornado like whatever natural disaster isn't near you is one that you're terrified of. Hurricanes, if you're somebody who like lives on the coast, you're kind of used to the idea of a hurricane. Not to say it's not scary, but whatever natural disaster isn't in your geographic region, like where I live in Nashville, sometimes we have tornadoes, and they're awful and they're scary, but you're used to them on some level. Nashville guy like me goes out to L.A., never been in an earthquake. So when you're in a, you know, a, a tall building, I would have been like, if there was a er- uh, tornado coming, I'd have been like, well, this is scary, but you're kind of used to it. And and the same thing, by the way, when I lived in the Caribbean, uh, you know, everybody's still kind of scared of, of hurricanes down there. But if you haven't ever been in a hurricane, you're super afraid of a hurricane. I remember one of my first trips when I started doing Big 12, and now I feel like a Big 12 veteran. Right. I don't know if the Big 12 feels like I'm a Big 12 veteran. but You've I, been everywhere. I like, yeah. I like doing Big 12 games for sure. And I remember one of my first trips to Oklahoma, I saw a T-shirt in the airport. And, of course, you know, desperate to get home, I saw a T-shirt in the airport that had a picture of a tornado on it. And it said, come at me. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, what the hell? Like, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know if I want to taunt a tornado. Yeah, how is this being celebrated? Like, that's pretty, that's unreal. But but you're absolutely right with the nat- natural disasters. But this particular earth. Quake clay, I did not feel, and uh, I was, uh, as you know, on uh, I was islanding over the weekend, so I still yeah, you were on have, Catalina, yeah, yeah, I still have like land sickness, so I felt like I've been rocking back and forward for like the last five days, so I'm not the guy to ask. Uh, the Dodgers are back. How much an interest did you uh, feel, even though it's a non-traditional baseball season? 
in what I thought was a pretty interesting back-to-back games against the Astros, right? I mean, it seemed like oh. it kind of took over everything, even though it's a, you know it felt different when you're watching it. But I sat and watched both those games, and I don't remember the last time I sat and watched, you know, really, let's call it early season baseball. But it was pretty compelling. Great theater. Well, and, and honestly, for a guy like you, too, because, I mean, uh, national baseball is not really something people are super interested in. You know right. what I mean? Yes. I mean, that it, the baseball does great, but it does great regionally because it's it's a very, you know, the, somebody who knows the whole starting lineup of the Dodgers is likely not to be able to name one, one or two players on the Cleveland Indians. Right. And, which is interesting, you know. Uh, so it's interesting that you watched uh, all, what was it, 22 innings? Yeah, I mean, I didn't Dodgers. watch every, every inning of every game, but I watched a lot of it, right? And I found myself pretty intrigued by by the uh, extra inning rules. I stayed up late, even though I got to get up early for the show, uh, and I wouldn't have anticipated that I was going to end up doing that. Right, and I was riveted. You know, I, I was I was all into it, and I didn't know that I would be either. And, you know, I enjoyed the basketball last night. And the, the... How would you assess? That's what, I was, that's what I was leading with. How would you assess the city of Los Angeles' interest in the Dodgers right now as it compares to the Battle of Los Angeles? Well, people are excited about uh, basketball, but I, I still think, you know, just like it kind of was with the Dodgers where it took a couple days and they beat the Giants up really bad in the first two games, and then the last two they lost and their bats kind of fell asleep to what is a very, very weak Giants team and the payrolls aren't even comparable, and that upset people. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody was kind of glued to their TV watching the Houston game, fans in the stands be damned. So that, I think that kind of, it took people that long to kind of get acclimated to it. I don't know how, 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 how much these guys are really going after it as opposed to what it's going to be like in the playoffs and the bubble, uh, especially for teams like the Lakers and the Clippers who, they they probably aren't going to lose any ground or momentum with these eight games. It's kind of more of a feeling out period, and I think we're going to have a feeling out period as as a fan base watching the basketball stuff, and everybody's going to have to make their peace with whatever political stance they want or don't want somebody to take. Uh, I saw education reform go for a couple rebounds <laughs> last night. That was fun to watch. Hey, uh, do you so for Major League Baseball? They had a big show at the start, the opening Thursday night, and we obviously saw the big show to start the NBA season last night. But do you feel like the NBA will be like Major League Baseball, where basically, I don't know about you, but when I watch Major League Baseball now, it feels, even though it's abnormal, it feels normal in the way the game's being played, right? It doesn't feel like there's some sort of political uh, angle hanging over it. Do you think the same thing will happen in the NBA, or do you think this is going to be an ongoing multi-month process? Well, I think it's totally going to be different. I mean, the NBA is totally different. I mean, a bubble for baseball with how many people are involved and the equipment and the ballparks and all that different stuff, it's it's really just not as feasible. But for basketball, you got 15 guys and, and the staff, and you, you, can, you, you have a lot of – leeway well the majority of those guys happen to be black so it, it, the political message and the whole i guess uh framing of it is going to be different and you're going to see it with the commercials and i mean lebron james is going to become the uh, Re- Rapino is going to become at Antonin Kobo, and you know, I mean, it's <laughs> there's going to be a big diverse message and all this different stuff, and people are going to have to figure out how they feel about it. And I, I don't like, I never, I was, you know, kind of freaked out a little bit after nine eleven, like every American was, but I got a little bit wary of like the super hardcore patriotism, just like the. The really, I don't know, it was an unbelievable backlash, and I understood why, but just the, I don't know if if I'm making any sense. Just kind no, of the, I, I get it. I mean, it was an yeah, inti- like, and, and then this feels like it's kind of the opposite direction. You know, it just feels like we're being kind of uh, saturated with 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 somebody's political message, and and I get it. I understand, and 
especially look, I was a captain of a football team that the majority of it was black. And there are certain things that they are the way they are. The arguments of today are about George Floyd. The ones we had were about Rodney King and and uh, the L.A. riots and, and different things of that nature. So it's really not new to me, uh, to be honest. The political messaging is pretty thick, though, in the NBA. And I understand why. I mean, the majority of the league is black. Do you think if the Lakers and the Clippers were playing in L.A. in the playoffs that it would be a bigger story than having them play in Orlando? Does that impact in any way uh, the way that the games feel? Well, I think it impacts it because those games, like if the Lakers are playing the Clippers in the playoffs, I mean, we're putting on Barry from Barry's Tickets to talk about how much uh, a ticket in the upper bowl is going. for. And it's wild around the Staples Center. Like you guys broadcast for the opening of the NBA season for the Clippers and the Lakers to start the season. People uh, show up. That yeah, have, that's right. It's like when Kobe died. People just show up at the Staples Center for no reason. Even if they have no tickets, they're just there to be there. So it's certainly different, but I think just like the Dodgers, it's different, but we all embrace it. And look, I, I respect these guys for having a pull. I, I am fully into whatever your work is, allows you to do you should be allowed to do. Obviously, the NBA is facilitating these guys to have their say politically, and they're taking full advantage of it. I don't know how long it will go. I think it's going to prolong itself much more than baseball because of the circumstances. And if if your work lets you get away with more, if you could say the F word on all the radio stations that you work on, Clay, you would, right? Probably occasionally, although I, I, I've tried to cur- cut out all the cursing in my show. But I do wish we could have no But FCC you would, though. Eventually. I mean, you, yes. you curse on I, I Twitter, wish we could right? Ha- I, yes. I, I wish we could have no FCC restrictions on the radio show. I do wish that. Uh, right. All right. So, I mean, whatever your work lets you get away with, I mean, if they let you get away with saying things that are even more racy than the things you say, you probably – would so if the NBA is going to facilitate these guys to have a message and it's part of them going out and playing and doing what they do to entertain the country, then that's fine. You know, if baseball is going to let everybody do whatever they want to do, that that's cool. You have to negotiate these things with your players' unions. And that's kind of the biggest problem that the NFL ran into in the first place. They took a bunch of military money in advertising. They brought the guys out there for the anthem because of it. They put the cameras on the guys during the anthem, but they never figured out with the players' union or gave them a cut of the advertising money as to what was going to be done while the anthem was planned. And that's a form of propaganda, too. So, uh, you know, I see a lot of it. I, I see all uh, this through a, a, a lot of different lenses. And I'm just glad to watch the athletes moving around again. It's been a long time, right? Yeah, speaking of the athletes moving around, you know who used to move around a lot and be very athletic? Jeff Goldblum. You know, um, he's still pretty, he still looks pretty good. You know, I agree. He's 67 I mean, he's been, now. I, I watched um, – so we had the kids. It's just it's funny. you got to let it go, up. Clay. you just got to let it go. We watched all five of the Jurassic Parks, including the first two uh, Jurassic Parks. So let's talk about Goldblum stealing your girl and finally get to the bottom of it. Okay. See, you know, here is why people – some people have an issue with the way you go about your business. I have constantly told you what the circumstances of this situation were, and I'm not lying. If I need to get people on to corroborate it, I will. <laughs> but this was, not, this was not my girlfriend. So you keep saying it was my girlfriend, and you know he, she, he stole your girlfriend, he stole your girlfriend. He stole my date is a much more accurate way to put it. <laughs> I had right. a girlfriend who was in Italy. I was trying to get away for the weekend. I didn't want to go alone. I tried to get this girl to go with me who I was casually dating. She ended up with Goldblum instead. I was upset. I hated Goldblum for years. I'm not going to say it didn't miss me as it would any young man who had confidence in himself, <laughs> even if he had a long, sharp nose. But it was not my girlfriend. It wasn't like my girlfriend disappeared for a weekend with Goldblum 
<laughs> and I took her back. That's not the case. So, uh, so whatever ha- – like, have you ever seen Goldblum out in person in L.A.? Yes. And, like, no conversation, though. No, well, I used to see Goldblum all – yeah, all the time. People talk to – Goldblum is a weird dude. And, I mean, he's a, he used to sit in a band before COVID, of course. Uh, he used to sit in a band that played in the – you're familiar with the Los Feliz area – uh, in Los Angeles, if you're familiar with the movie Swingers. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you know? for sure. Yes. Uh, he used to, that's kind of a hipster area, and he used to sit in a band, I mean, he plays all kinds of different instruments. Uh, he plays a keyboard in this band, and uh, it's called uh, Jeff Goldblum and the Mildred Snitzer <laughs> Orchestra. So and, Goldblum, multi-talented. Yeah, so like, you could, if you want to see, I know how much you love seeing movie stars. So, like, if if LA is up and running, if you're like Tuesdays and Thursdays at one of those bars in Los Feliz, Goldblum's just sitting there uh, playing the keyboard, and he'll talk to anybody. I used to see him at independent rock shows, and Goldblum, let's just put it like this: he's cut a wide swath with the ladies. Yes, and he's not the only weird, creepy-looking actor over the years to be a known slinger. Uh, there's Milton Berle. The comedian, <laughs> Yo, yeah. Uncle Milty, who was known as one of the most well-endowed comedians in the history of the world. Uh, there was uh, Peter Laurie. Are you familiar with that name? Peter Laurie. Oh, that's the uh, yeah, that's the Casablanca guy from Blanca uh, and well, the Maltese. The guy that yeah. goes, Rick, Rick, hide me, please. No, no, but was it was it Peter Laurie uh, like a German actor? Uh, he was made? German. Very good. Yeah. No, no, but I'm saying like he was in German silent films. Yes, and he also had a giant, giant penis and just laid it across Hollywood Boulevard like a speed bump. So, it, Peter Laurie from Casablanca, Peter Laurie from the Maltese Falcon. Yes, uh, so these, Goldblum is in their image, you know, uh, a character actor, a little bit odd, but a huge ladies' man uh, and known over the years to be so. Peter Lorre was, uh, by the way, Hungarian, but I'm going to look him up because I remember when I was in, uh, in yeah, he was in um, M, which was a really, really famous uh, film. Yes, it's like a, it's, a, it's a university movie. Yeah, right. But I mean, all of these, so I did because uh, I got into Rush. I watched, a Ru- I took a class in Russian sem- cinema and in German cinema. 1931 as Hans Beckert, the movie M, German thriller film directed by Fritz Lang, starring Peter Lorre. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari was one of the most famous German expressionist films that was ever made, by the way. Probably didn't expect to get into that. So uh, so the girl that you're somewhat interested in chooses to go hang out with uh, with Goldblum. For the weekend. Yeah, the weekend. And then later, what happens? The girl, like... (sighs) Like well, later what other? happened, you know, I mean, I, it probably took me months to forgive her. I believe she came <laughs> around. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it was before or after I got hurt or what. She ended up coming around a Make, little coming, bit. Coming to her senses? No, but just like coming to my house, you know. Uh, she uh, In the year 2000. Okay. So, uh, whatever. I don't know how, Do you I don't any know how idea? far that was separated from... Goldblum or not, to be honest. Do you this same idea? woman, I try to tell you, and you wouldn't even listen, this same girl, I believe, dated the thin-lipped Kyle Shanahan, the head coach of the 49ers. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so do you, so do She's you know, like the female version of Goldblum. She is the female version of Goldblum, maybe. Perhaps she was maybe. tall. Uh, so what, uh, by the way... <laughs> I'm glad we finally got an answer, but do you know what this girl does now? Is she still in L.A.? Yeah, she married a car dealer in uh, Denver and has children. Okay. Everything gets boring eventually. Yeah. It would be Even for Goldblum. Be- Goldblum's married with kids now, too. He married a young gymnast. That's uh, an unbelievable story. Uh, Did you know that? No, Goldblum I, I mean, married like a woman I, 30 years his junior. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that he married somebody 30 years younger than him because he looks, uh, you know, um, like he's 20 years younger than he, than he actually is. Peter he's Lord probably going to outlive both times. of us. He's probably going to outlive both of us, Petros. Oh, um, I hope not. 
I hope not too, uh, because he's t- t- nearly 30 years older. Uh, hey, I appreciate you coming on early with us again for a second day this week. I just wanted to get to the bottom of uh, your love affair um, and uh, and also hang out and uh, talk about the uh, all the wonderful things going on now that sports are back. Does it still feel weird to you, by the way, that sports are back finally after all the time we had where there was nothing going on? You know, I felt weird that we had like all kinds of box scores, but we were still talking about Montre. We were still talking about Montrez Harrell versus Lou Williams versus Kendrick Perkins on Twitter. Yes, like you know, back up, youngster. You know, like we're <laughs> reading tweets back and forth, and it's like, dude, we we have other things to talk about. It's almost kind of like we forgot how to do it. But hey, look, I'm a football analyst, so when there's football to analyze, oh yeah, I meant to ask story. you about that. Do you feel like there's a lot of uncertainty now going on? surrounding college football and obviously the SEC decision, the Pac-12 decision, like everything that's going on. The Big Ten has to make – like do you feel good as a guy who calls college football games about college football playing? Well, I feel good about it. Look, I just think overall this has to shake the truth out of the throat of the actual sport, right? I mean, we all love stories about student athletes, quote-unquote, but that's not what's happening here. These are billion-dollar industries that are wrapped up in institutions of higher education. And all of a sudden, all these people who are kind of saying, shut it down, and we can't do this, and how could we do this? These are young people. These are student-athletes. Like, they've suddenly become the skeptics of our industry. Like, these people have suddenly become the uh, realists of what we do. No, I don't think so. You don't all of a sudden get to become a realist in the media when most of the time all you do is wash balls. That you Look at what you do for a living. I mean, look at what this sport is. It's a tough hard sport that ruins people's bodies, and it's wrapped up in our institutions of higher education. Why? A, for the branding, and A, for the money. And those things have to continue. They need the money, just like the NBA is playing for the money right now, MLB is playing for the money, NFL is going to play for the money, college is just the same. Even the MLS is playing for the money. I mean, there's enough money to be made in the MLS for them to create a bubble, for God's sakes. So college has to play because it's about the money. It's not about student athletes or anything like that. It never has been. College football is a revenue sport. It is a pro sport inside higher education. And anybody that argues that is going to see how quickly red tape gets cut through to make this thing happen because it's a pro sport within colleges and it funds the universities, whole athletic departments and colleges in some cases and definitely helps them raise money and the whole branding episode of it. So to me, it has to happen. Everybody's going to get their 10 games and play within their conferences because that's what they can control. Notre Dame and the ACC figured something out, and it's going to have to be like a pro football type of deal. If you want to play, you're going to have to go full protocol and try to control your players and be as diligent as you can. But if you think they're not going to try to play college football, you're crazy as hell. Petros Papadakis, thank you for getting up early with us. Have a fantastic weekend, and uh, I'd encourage all of you to go listen to his show, AM570LA Sports.